The Dunwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft Gorgons and Hydras and Chimeras, dire stories of Teleno and the Harpies, may reproduce themselves in the brain of superstition, but they were there before. They are transcripts, types. The archetypes are in us and eternal. How else should the recital of that which we know in a waking sense to be false come to affect us at all? Is it that we naturally conceive terror from such objects, considered in their capacity of being able to inflict upon us bodily injury? Oh, least of all, these terrors are of older standing. They date beyond body, or without the body, they would have been the same. That the kind of fear here treated is purely spiritual, that it is strong in proportion as it is objectless on earth, that it predominates in the period of our sinless infancy, are difficulties the solution of which might afford some probable insight into our anti-mundane condition, and a peep at least into the shadowland of pre-existence. Charles Lamb, Witches and Other Night Fears Chapter 1 When a traveller in north-central Massachusetts takes the wrong fork at the junction of the Aylesbury Pike, just beyond Dean's Corners, he comes upon a lonely and curious country. The ground gets higher, and the briar-bordered stone walls press closer and closer against the ruts of the dusty, curving road. The trees of the frequent forest belt seem too large, and the wild weeds, brambles and grasses attain a luxuriance not often found in settled regions. At the same time the planted fields appear singularly few and barren, while the sparsely scattered houses wear a surprisingly uniform aspect of age, squalor and dilapidation. Without knowing why, one hesitates to ask directions from the gnarled, solitary figures spied now and then on crumbling doorsteps or on the sloping, rock-strown meadows. Those figures are so silent and furtive that one feels somehow confronted by forbidden things with which it would be better to have nothing to do. When a rise in the road brings the mountains in view above the deep woods, the feeling of strange uneasiness is increased. The summits are too rounded and symmetrical to give a sense of comfort and naturalness, and sometimes the sky silhouettes with especial clearness, the queer circles of tall stone pillars with which most of them are crowned. Gorges and ravines of problematical depth intersect the way, and the crude wooden bridges always seem of dubious safety. When the road dips again, there are stretches of marshland that one instinctively dislikes, and indeed almost fears at evening when unseen whippoorwills chatter and the fireflies come out in abnormal profusion to dance to the raucous, creepily insistent rhythms of stridently piping bullfrogs. The thin, shining line of the Miskatonic's upper reaches has an oddly serpent-like suggestion as it winds close to the feet of the domed hills among which it rises. As the hills draw nearer, one heeds their wooded sides more than their stone-crowned tops. Those sides loom up so darkly and precipitously that one wishes they would keep their distance, but there is no road by which to escape them. Across a covered bridge, one sees a small village huddled between the stream and the vertical slope of Round Mountain, and wonders at the cluster of rotting gambrel roofs bespeaking an earlier architectural period than that of the neighboring region. It is not reassuring to see, on a closer glance, that most of the houses are deserted and falling to ruin, and that the broken steepled church now harbors the one slovenly mercantile establishment of the hamlet. One dreads to trust the tenebrous tunnel of the bridge, yet there is no way to avoid it. Once across, it is hard to prevent the impression of a faint malign odor about the village street, as of the massed mold and decay of centuries. It is always a relief to get clear of the place and to follow the narrow road around the base of the hills and across the level country beyond, till it rejoins the Aylesbury Pike. Afterward, one sometimes learns that one has been through Dunwich. Outsiders visit Dunwich as seldom as possible, and since a certain season of horror, all the signboards pointing toward it have been taken down. The scenery, judged by any ordinary aesthetic canon, is more than commonly beautiful. Yet there is no influx of artists or summer tourists. Two centuries ago, when talk of witch blood, Satan worship, and strange forest presences was not laughed at, it was the custom to give reasons for avoiding the locality.
in our sensible age, since the Dunwich horror of 1928 was hushed up by those who had the town's and the world's welfare at heart, people shun it without knowing exactly why. Perhaps one reason, though it cannot apply to uninformed strangers, is that the people are now repellently decadent. The old gentry, representing the two or three armigerous families which came from Salem in 1692, have kept somewhat above the general level of decay. Though many branches are sunk into the populace so deeply that only their names remain as a key to their origins. Some of the Waitleys and bishops still send their eldest sons to Harvard and Miskatonic, though those sons seldom return to the mouldering gambrel roofs under which they and their ancestors were born. No one, even those who have the facts concerning the recent horror, can say just what is the matter with Dunwich. Though old legends speak of unhallowed rites and conclaves of the natives, amidst which they called forbidden shapes of shadow out of the great rounded hills, and made wild fevered prayers that were answered by loud crackings and rumblings from the ground below. In 1747, the Reverend Abijah Hoadley, newly come to the Congregational Church at Dunwich Village, preached a memorable sermon on the close presence of Satan and his imps, in which he said, It must be allowed that these blasphemies of an infernal train of demons are matters of too common knowledge to be denied. The cursed voices of Azazel and Buzrael, of Beelzebub and Belial, being heard now from underground by above a score of credible witnesses now living. I myself did not more than a fortnight ago catch a very plain discourse of evil powers in the hill behind my house, wherein there were a rattling and rolling, groaning, screeching and hissing, such as no things of this earth could raise up, and which must needs have come from those caves that only black magic can discover, and only the divel unlock. Mr. Hoadley disappeared soon after delivering this sermon but the text, printed in Springfield, is still extant. Noises in the hills continue to be reported from year to year and still form a puzzle to geologists and physiographers. Other traditions tell of foul odors near the hill-crowning circles of stone pillars and of rushing airy presences to be heard faintly at certain hours from stated points at the bottom of the great ravines. While still others, Try to explain the devil's hopyard, a bleak, blasted hillside where no tree, shrub, or grass blade will grow. Then, too, the natives are mortally afraid of the numerous whippoorwills which grow vocal on warm nights. It is vowed that the birds are psychopomps lying in wait for the souls of the dying, and that they time their eerie cries in unison with the sufferer's struggling breath. If they can catch the fleeing soul when it leaves the body, they instantly flutter away, chittering in demoniac laughter. But if they fail, they subside gradually into a disappointed silence. These tales, of course, are obsolete and ridiculous, because they come down from very old times. Dunwich is indeed ridiculously old, older by far than any of the communities within thirty miles of it. South of the village one may still spy the cellar walls and chimney of the ancient bishop house, which was built before 1700 whilst the ruins of the mill at the falls, built in 1806, form the most modern piece of architecture to be seen. Industry did not flourish here, and the 19th century factory movement proved short-lived. Oldest of all are the great rings of rough-hewn stone columns on the hilltops, but these are more generally attributed to the natives than to the settlers. Deposits of skulls and bones found within these circles and around the sizable table-like rock on Sentinel Hill, sustain the popular belief that such spots were once the burial places of the Pokum Tucks, even though many ethnologists, disregarding the absurd improbability of such a theory, persist in believing the remains non-native. Chapter 2 It was in the township of Dunwich, in a large and partly inhabited farmhouse, set against a hillside four miles from the village, and a mile and a half from any other dwelling, that Wilbur Waitley was born at 5 a.m. on Sunday, the 2nd of February, 1913. This date was recalled because it was Candlemas, which people in Dunwich curiously observe under another name, and because the noises in the hills had sounded, and all the dogs of the countryside had barked persistently throughout the night before. Less worthy of notice was the fact that the mother was one of the decadent Waitleys 
a somewhat unattractive albino woman of 35, living with an aged and half-insane father about whom the most frightful tales of wizardry had been whispered in his youth. Lavinia Waitley had no known husband, but according to the custom of the region made no attempt to disavow the child, concerning the other side of whose ancestry the country folk might, and did, speculate as widely as they chose. On the contrary, she seemed strangely proud of the dark, goatish-looking infant who formed such a contrast to her own albinism and was heard to mutter many curious prophecies about its unusual powers and tremendous future. Lavinia was one who would be apt to mutter such things, for she was a lone creature, given to wandering amidst thunderstorms in the hills and trying to read the great odorous books which her father had inherited through two centuries of Whiteleys and which were fast falling to pieces with age and wormholes. She had never been to school, but was filled with disjointed scraps of ancient lore that Old Waitley had taught her. The remote farmhouse had always been feared because of Old Waitley's reputation for black magic, and the unexplained death by violence of Mrs. Waitley when Lavinia was twelve years old had not helped to make the place popular. Isolated among strange influences, Lavinia was fond of wild and grandiose daydreams and singular occupations, nor was her leisure much taken up by household cares in a home from which all standards of order and cleanliness had long since disappeared. There was a hideous screaming which echoed above even the hill noises and the dogs barking on the night Wilbur was born, but no known doctor or midwife presided at his coming. Neighbors knew nothing of him till a week afterward, when old Waitley drove his sleigh through the snow into Dunwich Village and discoursed incoherently to the group of loungers at Osborne's general store. There seemed to be a change in the old man, an added element of furtiveness in the clouded brain which subtly transformed him from an object to a subject of fear, though he was not one to be perturbed by any common family event. Amidst it all, he showed some trace of the pride later noticed in his daughter, and what he said of the child's paternity was remembered by many of his hearers years afterward. I don't care what folks think. If Lavany's boy looked like his pa, he wouldn't look like nothing you expect. You needn't think the only folks is the folks hereabouts. Lavinie's read some and has seed some things the most of you only tell about. I calculate her man is as good a husband as ye can find this side of Aylesbury, and if ye knowed as much about the hills as I do, ye wouldn't ask no better church wedding nor heron. Let me tell ye so then, some day you folks'll hear a child of Lavinie's a calling its father's name on the top of Sentinel Hill. The only persons who saw Wilbur during the first month of his life were old Zechariah Waitley, of the undecayed Waitleys, and Earl Sawyer's common-law wife, Mamie Bishop. Mamie's visit was frankly one of curiosity, and her subsequent tales did justice to her observations. But Zechariah came to lead a pair of Alderney cows, which Old Waitley had bought of his son Curtis. This marked the beginning of a course of cattle buying on the part of small Wilbur's family, which ended only in 1928, when the Dunwich horror came and went. Yet at no time did the ramshackle Waitley barn seem overcrowded with livestock. There came a period when people were curious enough to steal up and count the herd that grazed precariously on the steep hillside above the old farmhouse, and they could never find more than ten or twelve anemic, bloodless-looking specimens. Evidently some blight or distemper, perhaps sprung from the unwholesome pasturage or the diseased fungi and timbers of the filthy barn, caused a heavy mortality amongst the weightly animals. Odd wounds or sores, having something of the aspect of incisions, seemed to afflict the visible cattle, and once or twice during the earlier months, certain callers fancied they could discern similar sores about the throats of the grey, unshaven old man and his albino daughter. In the spring after Wilbur's birth, Lavinia resumed her customary rambles in the hills, bearing in her misproportioned arms the child. Public interest in the Waitleys subsided after most of the country folk had seen the baby and no one bothered to comment on the swift development which that newcomer seemed every day to exhibit. Wilbur's growth was indeed phenomenal, for within three months of his birth he had attained a size and muscular power not usually found in infants under a full year of age. His motions and even his vocal sounds 
showed a restraint and deliberateness highly peculiar in an infant, and no one was really unprepared when at seven months he began to walk unassisted, with falterings which another month was sufficient to remove. It was somewhat after this time, on Halloween, that a great blaze was seen at midnight on the top of Sentinel Hill, where the old table-like stone stands amidst its tumulus of ancient bones. Considerable talk was started when Silas Bishop, of the undecayed bishops, mentioned having seen the boy running sturdily up that hill ahead of his mother about an hour before the blaze was remarked. Silas was rounding up a stray heifer, but he nearly forgot his mission when he fleetingly spied the two figures in the dim light of his lantern. They darted almost noiselessly through the underbrush, and the astonished watcher seemed to think they were entirely unclothed. Afterward, he could not be sure about the boy, who may have had some kind of a fringe belt and a pair of dark trunks or trousers on. Wilbur was never subsequently seen alive and conscious without complete and tightly buttoned attire, the disarrangement or threatened disarrangement of which always seemed to fill him with anger and alarm. His contrast with his squalid mother and grandfather in this respect was thought very notable until the horror of 1928 suggested the most valid of reasons. The next January gossips were mildly interested in the fact that Lavinie's brat had commenced to talk and at the age of only 11 months. His speech was somewhat remarkable both because of its difference from the ordinary accents of the region and because it displayed a freedom from infantile lisping of which many children of three or four might well be proud. The boy was not talkative, yet when he spoke he seemed to reflect some elusive element wholly unpossessed by Dunwich and its denizens. The strangeness did not reside in what he said, or even in the simple idioms he used, but seemed vaguely linked with his intonation or with the internal organs that produced the spoken sounds. His facial aspect too was remarkable for its maturity, for though he shared his mother's and grandfather's chinlessness, his firm and precociously shaped nose united with the expression of his large, dark, almost Latin eyes to give him an air of quasi-adulthood and well-nigh preternatural intelligence. He was, however, exceedingly ugly, despite his appearance of brilliancy, there being something almost goatish or animalistic about his lips, large pored, yellowish skin, coarse crinkly hair, and oddly elongated ears. He was soon disliked even more decidedly than his mother and grandsire, and all conjectures about him were spiced with references to the bygone magic of old Waitley, and how the hills once shook when he shrieked the dreadful name of Yog sothoth in the midst of a circle of stones, with a great book open in his arms before him. Dogs abhorred the boy, and he was always obliged to take various defensive measures against their barking menace. Chapter 3 Meanwhile, Old Waitley continued to buy cattle without measurably increasing the size of his herd. He also cut timber and began to repair the unused parts of his house, a spacious, peaked-roofed affair whose rear end was buried entirely in the rocky hillside and whose three least-ruined ground-floor rooms had always been sufficient for himself and his daughter. There must have been prodigious reserves of strength in the old man to enable him to accomplish so much hard labor and though he still babbled dementedly at times, his carpentry seemed to show the effects of sound calculation. It had already begun as soon as Wilbur was born, when one of the many tool sheds had been put suddenly in order, clabberded and fitted with a stout fresh lock. Now, in restoring the abandoned upper story of the house, he was a no less thorough craftsman. His mania showed itself only in his tight boarding up of all the windows in the reclaimed section though many declared that it was a crazy thing to bother with the reclamation at all. Less inexplicable was his fitting up of another downstairs room for his new grandson, a room which several callers saw, though no one was ever admitted to the closely boarded upper story. This chamber he lined with tall, firm shelving, along which he began gradually to arrange, in apparently careful order, all the rotting ancient books and parts of books, which during his own day had been heaped promiscuously in odd corners of the various rooms. I made some use of them, he would say as he tried to mend a torn black letter page with paste prepared on the rusty kitchen stove. But the boy's fitten to make better use of them. He'd ought to have them as well sot as he kin, for they're going to be all of his larnin'. When Wilbur was a year and seven months old, 
In September of 1914, his size and accomplishments were almost alarming. He had grown as large as a child of four and was a fluent and incredibly intelligent talker. He ran freely about the fields and hills and accompanied his mother on all her wanderings. At home, he would pore diligently over the queer pictures and charts in his grandfather's books, while old Waitley would instruct and catechize him through long, hushed afternoons. By this time the restoration of the house was finished, and those who watched it wondered why one of the upper windows had been made into a solid plank door. It was a window in the rear of the east gable end, close against the hill, and no one could imagine why a cleated wooden runway was built up to it from the ground. About the period of this work's completion, people noticed that the old tool house, tightly locked and windowlessly clabbered since Wilbur's birth, had been abandoned again. The door swung listlessly open, and when Earl Sawyer once stepped within after a cattle-selling call on Old Waitley, he was quite discomposed by the singular odour he encountered. Such a stench he averred, as he had never before smelt in all his life, except near the native circles on the hills, and which could not come from anything sane or of this earth. But then, the homes and sheds of Dunwich folk have never been remarkable for olfactory immaculateness. The following months were void of visible events, save that everyone swore to a slow but steady increase in the mysterious hill noises. On May Eve of 1915 there were tremors which even the Aylesbury people felt, whilst the following Halloween produced an underground rumbling queerly synchronized with bursts of flame, them which Waitley's doings, from the summit of Sentinel Hill. Wilbur was growing up uncannily, so that he looked like a boy of ten as he entered his fourth year. He read avidly by himself now, but talked much less than formerly. A settled taciturnity was absorbing him, and for the first time people began to speak specifically of the dawning look of evil in his goatish face. He would sometimes mutter an unfamiliar jargon and chant in bizarre rhythms which chilled the listener with a sense of unexplainable terror. The aversion displayed toward him by dogs had now become a matter of wide remark, and he was obliged to carry a pistol in order to traverse the countryside in safety. His occasional use of the weapon did not enhance his popularity amongst the owners of canine guardians. The few callers at the house would often find Lavinia alone on the ground floor, while odd cries and footsteps resounded in the boarded-up second story. She would never tell what her father and the boy were doing up there, though once she turned pale and displayed an abnormal degree of fear when a jocose fish peddler tried the locked door leading to the stairway. That peddler told the store loungers at Dunwich Village that he thought he heard a horse stamping on that floor above. The loungers reflected, thinking of the door and runway, and of the cattle that so swiftly disappeared. Then they shuddered as they recalled tales of old Waitley's youth, and of the strange things that are called out of the earth when a bullock is sacrificed at the proper time to certain heathen gods. It had for some time been noticed that dogs had begun to hate and fear the whole Whiteley place as violently as they hated and feared young Wilbur personally. In 1917 the war came, and Squire Sawyer Whiteley, as chairman of the local draft board, had hard work finding a quota of young Dunwich men fit even to be sent to a development camp. The government, alarmed at such signs of wholesale regional decadence, sent several officers and medical experts to investigate, conducting a survey which New England newspaper readers may still recall. It was the publicity attending this investigation which set reporters on the track of the Waitleys and caused the Boston Globe and Arkham Advertiser to print flamboyant Sunday stories of young Wilbur's precociousness, old Waitley's black magic, the shelves of strange books, the sealed second story of the ancient farmhouse, and the weirdness of the whole region and its hill noises. Wilbur was four and a half then, and looked like a lad of fifteen. His lips and cheeks were fuzzy with a coarse dark down, and his voice had begun to break. Earl Sawyer went out to the Waitley place with both sets of reporters and cameramen, and called their attention to the queer stench which now seemed to trickle down from the sealed upper spaces. It was, he said, exactly like a smell he had found in the tool shed, abandoned, when the house was finally repaired, and like the faint odours which he sometimes thought he caught near the stone circles on the mountains.
Dunwich folk read the stories when they appeared and grinned over the obvious mistakes. They wondered, too, why the writers made so much of the fact that Old Waitley always paid for his cattle in gold pieces of extremely ancient date. The Wotleys had received their visitors with ill-concealed distaste, though they did not dare court further publicity by a violent resistance or refusal to talk. Chapter 4 For a decade the annals of the Waitleys sink indistinguishably into the general life of a morbid community used to their queer ways and hardened to their May Eve and All Hallows celebrations. Twice a year they would light fires on the top of Sentinel Hill, at which times the mountain rumblings would recur with greater and greater violence. While at all seasons there were strange and portentous doings at the lonely farmhouse. In the course of time, callers professed to hear sounds in the sealed upper story, even when all the family were downstairs, and they wondered how swiftly, or how lingeringly, a cow or bullock was usually sacrificed. There was talk of a complaint to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, but nothing ever came of it, since Dunwich folk are never anxious to call the outside world's attention to themselves. About 1923, when Wilbur was a boy of ten, whose mind, voice, stature and bearded face gave all the impressions of maturity, a second great siege of carpentry went on at the old house. It was all inside the sealed upper part, and from bits of discarded lumber, people concluded that the youth and his grandfather had knocked out all the partitions and even removed the attic floor, leaving only one vast open void between the ground story and the roof. They had torn down the great central chimney, too, and fitted the rusty range with a flimsy outside tin stovepipe. In the spring after this event, Old Waitley noticed the growing number of whippoorwills that would come out of Cold Spring Glen to chirp under his window at night. He seemed to regard the circumstance as one of great significance, and told the loungers at Osborne's that he thought his time had almost come. They whistle just in tune with my breathing now, he said, and I guess they're getting ready to catch my soul. They know it's a going out and don't calculate to miss it. You'll know, boys, after I'm gone, whether they get me or not. F they do, they'll keep up a singing and laughing till break a day. F they don't, they'll kind of quiet down like. I expect them and the souls they hunts for have some pretty tough tussles sometimes. On Lammas night, 1924, Dr. Houghton of Aylesbury was hastily summoned by Wilbur Waitley, who had lashed his one remaining horse through the darkness and telephoned from Osborne's in the village. He found old Waitley in a very grave state, with a cardiac action and stertorous breathing that told of an end not far off. The shapeless albino daughter an oddly bearded grandson stood by the bedside, whilst from the vacant abyss overhead there came a disquieting suggestion of rhythmical surging or lapping as of the waves on some level beach. The doctor, though, was chiefly disturbed by the chattering nightbirds outside, a seemingly limitless legion of whippoorwills that cried their endless message in repetitions timed diabolically to the wheezing gasps of the dying man. It was uncanny and unnatural. Too much, thought Dr. Houghton, like the whole of the region he had entered so reluctantly in response to the urgent call. Toward one o'clock, Old Waitley gained consciousness and interrupted his wheezing to choke out a few words to his grandson. More space, Willie, more space soon. You grows and that grows faster. It'll be ready to sarve ye soon, boy. Open up the gates to Yogsothoth with the long chant that you'll find on page 751 of the complete edition, and then put a match to the prison. Fire from earth can't burn it no how. He was obviously quite mad. After a pause, during which the flock of whippoorwills outside adjusted their cries to the altered tempo, while some indications of the strange hill noises came from afar off, he added another sentence or two. Feed it regular, Willie, and mind the quantity, but don't let it grow too fast for the place, for F it busts quarters or gets a doubt afore ye opens to Yog Sothoth, it's all over and no use. Only them from beyond kin make it multiply and work. Only them, the old Ewans as wants to come back. But speech gave place to gasps again, and Lavinia screamed at the way the whippoorwills followed the change. It was the same for more than an hour, when the final throaty rattle came. 
Dr. Houghton drew shrunken lids over the glazing grey eyes as the tumult of birds faded imperceptibly to silence. Lavinia sobbed, but Wilbur only chuckled whilst the hill noises rumbled faintly. They didn't get him, he muttered in his heavy bass voice. Wilbur was by this time a scholar of really tremendous erudition in his one-sided way, and was quietly known by correspondence to many librarians in distant places where rare and forbidden books of old days are kept. He was more and more hated and dreaded around Dunwich because of certain youthful disappearances which suspicion laid vaguely at his door, but was always able to silence inquiry through fear or through use of that fund of old-time gold, which still, as in his grandfather's time, went forth regularly and increasingly for cattle buying. He was now tremendously mature of aspect, and his height, having reached the normal adult limit, seemed inclined to wax beyond that figure. In 1925, when a scholarly correspondent from Miskatonic University called upon him one day and departed pale and puzzled, he was fully six and three-quarters feet tall. Through all the years Wilbur had treated his albino mother with a growing contempt, finally forbidding her to go to the hills with him on May Eve and Hallow Mass. And in 1926, the poor creature complained to Mamie Bishop of being afraid of him. There's more about him as I knows than I can tell you, Mamie, she said. And nowadays there's more nor what I know myself. I vow I for God I don't know what he wants nor what he's a-trying to do. That Halloween the hill noises sounded louder than ever, and fire burned on Sentinel Hill as usual. But people paid more attention to the rhythmical screaming of vast flocks of unnaturally belated whippoorwills, which seemed to be assembled near the unlighted Wotley farmhouse. After midnight, their shrill notes burst into a kind of pandemoniac cachination which filled all the countryside, and not until dawn did they finally quiet down. Then they vanished, hurrying southward, where they were fully a month overdue. What this meant, no one could quite be certain till later. None of the country folk seemed to have died, but poor Lavinia Wotley was never seen again. In the summer of 1927, Wilbur repaired two sheds in the farmyard and began moving his books and effects out to them. Soon afterward, Earl Sawyer told the loungers at Osborne's that more carpentry was going on in the Waitley farmhouse. Wilbur was closing all the doors and windows on the ground floor and seemed to be taking out partitions as he and his grandfather had done upstairs four years before. He was living in one of the sheds and Sawyer thought he seemed unusually worried and tremulous. People generally suspected him of knowing something about his mother's disappearance, and very few ever approached his neighborhood now. His height had increased to more than seven feet and showed no signs of ceasing its development. Chapter 5 The following winter brought an event no less strange than Wilbur's first trip outside the Dunwich region. Correspondence with the Widener Library at Harvard, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, the British Museum, the University of Buenos Aires, and the Library of Miskatonic University of Arkham had failed to get him the loan of a book he desperately wanted. So at length he set out in person, shabby, dirty, bearded, and uncouth of dialect, to consult the copy at Miskatonic, which was the nearest to him geographically. Almost eight feet tall, and carrying a cheap new valise from Osborne's general store, this dark and goatish gargoyle appeared one day in Arkham in quest of the dreaded volume kept under lock and key at the college library, the hideous necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al-Hazred in Olaus Warmius's Latin version as printed in Spain in the 17th century. He had never seen a city before, but had no thought save to find his way to the university grounds, where, indeed, he passed heedlessly by the great white-fanged watchdog that barked with unnatural fury and enmity and tugged frantically at its stout chain. Wilbur had with him the priceless but imperfect copy of Dr. D's English version, which his grandfather had bequeathed him, and upon receiving access to the Latin copy, he at once began to collate the two texts, with the aim of discovering a certain passage which would have come on the 751st page of his own defective volume. This much he could not civilly refrain from telling the librarian the same erudite Henry Armitage who had once called at the farm and who now politely plied him with questions. He was looking, he had to admit, 
for a kind of formula or incantation containing the frightful name Yog sothoth and it puzzled him to find discrepancies, duplications, and ambiguities which made the matter of determination far from easy. As he copied the formula he finally chose, Dr. Armitage looked involuntarily over his shoulder at the open pages, the left-hand one of which, in the Latin version, contained such monstrous threats to the peace and sanity of the world. Nor is it to be thought, ran the text as Armitage mentally translated it, that man is either the oldest or the last of Earth's masters, or that the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. Not in the spaces we know, but between them, they walk serene and primal, undimensioned and to us unseen. Yog sothoth knows the gate. Yog sothoth is the gate. Yog sothoth is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, future, all are one in Yog sothoth He knows where the old ones broke through of old, and where they shall break through again. He knows where they have trod earth's fields, and where they still tread them and why no one can behold them as they tread. By their smell can men sometimes know them near, but of their semblance can no man know, saving only in the features of those they have begotten on mankind. And of those are there many sorts, differing in likeness from man's truest eidolon, to that shape without sight or substance which is them. They walk unseen and foul in lonely places where the words have been spoken, and the rites howled through at their seasons. The wind gibbers with their voices, and the earth mutters with their consciousness. They bend the forest and crush the city, yet may not forest or city behold the hand that smites. Cadath in the cold waste hath known them, and what man knows Cadath? The ice desert of the south and the sunken isles of ocean hold stones whereon their seal is engraven. But who hath seen the deep frozen city or the sealed tower long garlanded with seaweed and barnacles? Great Cthulhu is their cousin. Yet can he spy them only dimly. Aya, Shobnigarath, as a foulness shall ye know them. Their hand is at your throats, yet ye see them not, and their habitation is even one with your guarded threshold. Yog Sothoth is the key to the gate, whereby the spheres meet. Man rules now where they ruled once, they shall soon rule where man rules now. After summer is winter, and after winter summer, they wait patient and potent, for here shall they reign again. Dr. Armitage, Associating what he was reading with what he had heard of Dunwich and its brooding presences, and of Wilbur Whateley and his dim, hideous aura that stretched from a dubious birth to a cloud of probable matricide, felt a wave of fright as tangible as a draught of the tomb's cold clamminess. The bent, goatish giant before him seemed like the spawn of another planet or dimension, like something only partly of mankind and linked to black gulfs of essence and entity that stretch like titan phantasms beyond all spheres of force and matter, space and time. Presently, Wilbur raised his head and began speaking in that strange, resonant fashion, which hinted at sound-producing organs unlike the run of mankind's. Mr. Armitage, he said, I calculate I've got to take that book home. There's things in it I've got to try under certain conditions that I can't get here. And it's UD be a mortal sin to let a red tape rule hold me up. Let me take it along, sir, and I'll swore they won't nobody know the difference. I don't need to tell you I'll take good care of it. It won't me that put this D copy in the shape it is. He stopped as he saw firm denial on the librarian's face, and his own goatish features grew crafty. Armitage, half ready to tell him he might make a copy of what parts he needed, thought suddenly of the possible consequences and checked himself. There was too much responsibility in giving such a being the key to such blasphemous outer spheres. Wortley saw how things stood and tried to answer lightly. Well, all right, if you feel that way about it, maybe Harvard won't be so fussy as you be. And without saying more, he rose and strode out of the building, stooping at each doorway. Armitage heard the savage yelping of the great watchdog and studied Wotley's gorilla-like lope as he crossed the bit of campus visible from the window. He thought of the wild tales he had heard and recalled the old Sunday stories in the advertiser. These things, and the lore he had picked up from Dunwich rustics and villagers during his one visit there. Unseen things not of earth, 
or at least not of tri-dimensional Earth, rushed feted and horrible through New England's glens, and brooded obscenely on the mountaintops. Of this, he had long felt certain. Now he seemed to sense the close presence of some terrible part of the intruding horror, and to glimpse a hellish advance in the black dominion of the ancient and once passive nightmare. He locked away the Necronomicon with a shudder of disgust, but the room still reeked with an unholy and unidentifiable stench. As a foulness shall ye know them, he quoted. Yes, the odour was the same as that which had sickened him at the Waitley farmhouse less than three years before. He thought of Wilbur, goatish and ominous once again, and laughed mockingly at the village rumours of his parentage. Great God, what simpletons! Show them Arthur Machen's great god Pan, and they'll think it a common Dunwich scandal. But what thing, what cursed, shapeless influence on or off this three-dimensioned earth was Wilbur Waitley's father? Born on Candlemas, nine months after May Eve of 1912, when the talk about the queer earth noises reached clear to Arkham. What walked on the mountains that May night? What rudeness horror fastened itself on the world in half-human flesh and blood? During the ensuing weeks, Dr. Armitage set about to collect all possible data on Wilbur Waitley and the formless presences around Dunwich. He got in communication with Dr. Houghton of Aylesbury, who had attended Old Waitley in his last illness and found much to ponder over in the grandfather's last words as quoted by the physician. A visit to Dunwich Village failed to bring out much that was new, but a close survey of the Necronomicon in those parts which Wilbur had sought so avidly seemed to supply new and terrible clues to the nature, methods and desires of the strange evil so vaguely threatening this planet. Talks with several students of archaic lore in Boston and letters to many others elsewhere gave him a growing amazement which passed slowly through varied degrees of alarm to a state of really acute spiritual fear. As the summer drew on, he felt dimly that something ought to be done about the lurking terrors of the upper Miskatonic Valley and about the monstrous being known to the human world as Wilbur Waitley. Chapter 6 The Dunwich Horror Itself came between Lammas and the Equinox in 1928, and Dr. Armitage was among those who witnessed its monstrous prologue. He had heard, meanwhile, of Watley's grotesque trip to Cambridge, and of his frantic efforts to borrow or copy from the Necronomicon at the Widener Library. Those efforts had been in vain, since Armitage had issued warnings of the keenest intensity to all librarians having charge of the dreaded volume. Wilbur had been shockingly nervous at Cambridge, anxious for the book, yet almost equally anxious to get home again, as if he feared the results of being away long. Early in August the half-expected outcome developed, and in the small hours of the third, Dr. Armitage was awakened suddenly by the wild, fierce cries of the savage watchdog on the college campus. Deep and terrible, the snarling, half-mad growls and barks continued always in mounting volume, but with hideously significant pauses. Then there rang out a scream from a wholly different throat, such a scream as roused half the sleepers of Arkham and haunted their dreams ever afterward, such a scream as could come from no being born of earth or wholly of earth. Armitage, hastening into some clothing and rushing across the street and lawn to the college buildings, saw that others were ahead of him and heard the echoes of a burglar alarm still shrilling from the library. An open window showed black and gaping in the moonlight. What had come had indeed completed its entrance, for the barking and the screaming, now fast fading into a mixed low growling and moaning, proceeded unmistakably from within. Some instinct warned Armitage that what was taking place was not a thing for unfortified eyes to see, so he brushed back the crowd with authority as he unlocked the vestibule door. Among the others he saw Professor Warren Rice and Dr. Francis Morgan, men to whom he had told some of his conjectures and misgivings, and these two he motioned to accompany him inside. The inward sounds, except for a watchful droning whine from the dog, had by this time quite subsided, but Armitage now perceived with a sudden start that a loud chorus of whippoorwills among the shrubbery had commenced a damnably rhythmical piping, as if in unison with the last breaths of a dying man. The building was full of a frightful stench which Dr. Armitage knew too well. 
and the three men rushed across the hall to the small genealogical reading room whence the low whining came. For a second, nobody dared to turn on the light. Then Armitage summoned up his courage and snapped the switch. One of the three, it is not certain which, shrieked aloud at what sprawled before them among disordered tables and overturned chairs. Professor Rice declares that he wholly lost consciousness for an instant, though he did not stumble or fall. The thing that lay half-bent on its side in a fetid pool of greenish-yellow ichor and tarry stickiness was almost nine feet tall, and the dog had torn off all the clothing and some of the skin. It was not quite dead, but twitched silently and spasmodically, while its chest heaved in monstrous unison with the mad piping of the expectant whippoorwills outside. Bits of shoe leather and fragments of apparel were scattered about the room, and just inside the window, an empty canvas sack lay where it had evidently been thrown. Near the central desk, a revolver had fallen, a dented but undischarged cartridge, later explaining why it had not been fired. The thing itself, however, crowded out all other images at the time. It would be trite and not wholly accurate to say that no human pen could describe it, but one may properly say that it could not be vividly visualized by anyone whose ideas of aspect and contour are too closely bound up with the common life forms of this planet and of the three known dimensions. It was partly human, beyond a doubt, with very man-like hands and head, and the goatish, chinless face had the stamp of the Waitleys upon it. But the torso and lower parts of the body were teratologically fabulous, so that only generous clothing could ever have enabled it to walk on earth unchallenged or uneradicated. Above the waist it was semi-anthropomorphic, though its chest, where the dog's rending paws still rested watchfully, had the leathery, reticulated hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back was piebald with yellow and black, and dimly suggested the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, it was the worst, for here all human resemblance left off and sheer fantasy began. The skin was thickly covered with coarse black fur, and from the abdomen a score of long greenish-gray tentacles with red sucking mouths protruded limply. Their arrangement was odd and seemed to follow the symmetries of some cosmic geometry unknown to Earth or the solar system. On each of the hips, deep set in a kind of pinkish, ciliated orbit, was what seemed to be a rudimentary eye, whilst in lieu of a tail there depended a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annular markings and with many evidences of being an undeveloped mouth or throat. The limbs, save for their black fur, roughly resembled the hind legs of prehistoric Earth's giant saurians and terminated in ridgy-veined pads that were neither hooves nor claws. When the thing breathed, its tail and tentacles rhythmically changed colour as if from some circulatory cause normal to the non-human side of its ancestry. In the tentacles this was observable as a deepening of the greenish tinge, whilst in the tail it was manifest as a yellowish appearance which alternated with a sickly greyish white in the spaces between the purple rings. Of genuine blood there was none, only the fietid greenish-yellow ichor which trickled along the painted floor beyond the radius of the stickiness and left a curious discoloration behind it. As the presence of the three men seemed to rouse the dying thing, it began to mumble without turning or raising its head. Dr. Armitage made no written record of its mouthings, but asserts confidently that nothing in English was uttered. At first the syllables defied all correlation with any speech of earth, but toward the last there came some disjointed fragments, evidently taken from the Necronomicon, that monstrous blasphemy in quest of which the thing had perished. These fragments, as Armitage recalls them, ran something like Nagai, Nagagha, Bugshogog, Yaha, Yogsothoth, Yogsothoth. They trailed off into nothingness as the whippoorwills shrieked in rhythmical crescendos of unholy anticipation. Then came a halt in the gasping, and the dog raised its head in a long, lugubrious howl. A change came over the yellow, goatish face of the prostrate thing, and the great black eyes fell in appallingly. Outside the window the shrilling of the whippoorwills had suddenly ceased, and above the murmurs of the gathering crowd there came the sound of a panic-struck whirring and fluttering. Against the moon vast clouds of feathery watchers rose and raced from sight, frantic at that which they had sought for prey. All at once the dog started up abruptly, 
gave a frightened bark, and leapt nervously out of the window by which it had entered. A cry rose from the crowd, and Dr. Armitage shouted to the men outside that no one must be admitted till the police or medical examiner came. He was thankful that the windows were just too high to permit of peering in, and drew the dark curtains carefully down over each one. By this time two policemen had arrived, and Dr. Morgan, meeting them in the vestibule, was urging them for their own sakes to postpone entrance to the stench-filled reading room till the examiner came and the prostrate thing could be covered up. Meanwhile, frightful changes were taking place on the floor. One need not describe the kind and rate of shrinkage and disintegration that occurred before the eyes of Dr. Armitage and Professor Rice, but it is permissible to say that, aside from the external appearance of face and hands, the really human element in Wilbur Whateley must have been very small. When the medical examiner came, there was only a sticky whitish mass on the painted boards, and the monstrous odor had nearly disappeared. Apparently Whateley had had no skull or bony skeleton, at least in any true or stable sense. He had taken somewhat after his unknown father. Chapter 7 Yet all this was only the prologue of the actual Dunwich horror. Formalities were gone through by bewildered officials. Abnormal details were duly kept from press and public, and men were sent to Dunwich and Aylesbury to look up property and notify any who might be heirs of the late Wilbur Whateley. They found the countryside in great agitation, both because of the growing rumblings beneath the domed hills and because of the unwanted stench and the surging, lapping sounds which came increasingly from the great empty shell formed by Whateley's boarded-up farmhouse. Earl Sawyer, who tended the horse and cattle during Wilbur's absence, had developed a woefully acute case of nerves. The officials devised excuses not to enter the noisome boarded place, and were glad to confine their survey of the deceased's living quarters, the newly mended sheds, to a single visit. They filed a ponderous report at the courthouse in Aylesbury, and litigations concerning airship are said to be still in progress amongst the innumerable Waitleys, decayed and undecayed, of the upper Miskatonic Valley. An almost interminable manuscript in strange characters, written in a huge ledger, and adjudged a sort of diary because of the spacing and the variations in ink and penmanship, presented a baffling puzzle to those who found it on the old bureau which served as its owner's desk. After a week of debate, it was sent to Miskatonic University, together with the deceased's collection of strange books, for study and possible translation. But even the best linguists soon saw that it was not likely to be unriddled with ease. No trace of the ancient gold with which Wilbur and Old Waitley always paid their debts has yet been discovered. It was in the dark of September 9th that the horror broke loose. The hill noises had been very pronounced during the evening and dogs barked frantically all night. Early risers on the 10th noticed a peculiar stench in the air. About seven o'clock, Luther Brown, the hired boy at George Corey's, between Cold Spring Glen and the village, rushed frenziedly back from his morning trip to Ten Acre Meadow with the cows. He was almost convulsed with fright as he stumbled into the kitchen, and in the yard outside the no less frightened herd were pawing and lowing pitifully, having followed the boy back in the panic they shared with him. Between gasps, Luther tried to stammer out his tale to Mrs. Corey. Up there in the rud beyond the glen, Miss Corey, they southern been there. It smells like thunder, and all the bushes and little trees is pushed back from the rud like they'd a house been moved along of it. And that ain't the wust, nother. They's prints in the rud, Miss Corey. Great round prints as big as barrel heads, all sunk down deep like an elephant had been along. Only they's a sight more nor four feet could make. I looked at one or two afore I run, and I see everyone was covered with lines spreading out from one place, like as if big palm-leaf fans twicked or three times as big as any they is, head of Ben pounded down into the rud, and the smell was awful, like what it is around Wizard Waitley's old house. Here he faltered, and seemed to shiver afresh with the fright that had sent him flying home. Mrs. Corey, unable to extract more information, began telephoning the neighbors thus starting on its rounds the overture of panic that heralded the major terrors. When she got Sally Sawyer, 
housekeeper at Seth Bishop's, the nearest place to Whateley's, it became her turn to listen instead of transmit. For Sally's boy Chauncey, who slept poorly, had been up on the hill towards Whateley's and had dashed back in terror after one look at the place and at the pasturage where Mr. Bishop's cows had been left out all night. Yes, Miss Corey, came Sally's tremulous voice over the party wire. Chancy, he'd just come back a-posting, and couldn't have talk for being scared. He says old Waitley's house is all blowed up, with the timbers scattered round like they'd been dynamite inside. Only the bottom floor ain't through, but is all covered with a kind of tar-like stuff that smells awful and drips down off in the ages onto the ground where the side timbers is blown away. And there's awful kind of marks in the yard, too. Great round marks bigger round than a hogshead, and all sticky with stuff like is on the blowed up house. Chancy, he says, they leads off into the medders, where a great swath wider than a barn is matted down, and all the stun walls tumbled every which way wherever it goes. And he says, says he, Miss Corey, as how he sought to look for Seth's cows, frighted easy he was, and found him in the upper pasture nigh the devil's hop yard in an awful shape. Half on em's clean gone, and nigh half of them that's left is sucked most dry of blood, with sores on em like they's been on Watley's cattle ever St. Lavinie's brat was born. Seth, he's gone out now to look at em, though I'll vow he won't care to get very nigh wizard Watley's. Chance he didn't look careful to see where the big matted down swath led arter it left the pasturage, but he says he thinks it pinted towards the Glen Rudd to the village. I tell you, Miss Corey, there's suthin abroad as hadn't ought to be abroad, and I for one think that Wilbur Waitley, as come to the bad end he deserved, is at the bottom of the breeding of it. He won all human hisself, I allus says to everybody. And I think he and old Waitley must have raised something in that there nailed up house as ain't even so human as he was. They's allus been unseen things around Dunwich, living things, as ain't human and ain't good for human folks. The ground was a-talkin' last night. And towards morning, Chancy, he heard the whippoorwill so loud in cold spring glen. He couldn't sleep none. Then he thought he heard another faint-like sound over towards Wizard Waitley's. A kind of ripping or tearing a wood, like some big box or crate was being opened for off. What with this and that, he didn't get to sleep at all till sunup. And no sooner was he up this morning, but he's got to go over to Waitley's and see what's the matter. He see enough, I tell you, Miss Corey. This don't mean no good, and I think as all the men folks ought to get up a party and do suthin. I know suthin awful's about, and feel my time is nigh, though only God knows just what it is. Did your Luther take account to where them big tracks led to? No? Well, Miss Corey, ef they was on the Glen Rudd this side of the Glen, and ain't got to your house yet, I calculate they must go into the Glen itself. They would do that? I allus says Cold Spring Glen ain't no healthy nor decent place. The whippoorwills and fireflies there never did act like they was creators of God. And they's them as says ye can hear strange things a rushing and a talking in the air down there if ye stand in the right place between the rock falls and bear's den. By that noon, fully three quarters of the men and boys of Dunwich were trooping over the roads and meadows between the new made Waitley ruins and Cold Spring Glen, examining in horror the vast, monstrous prints the maimed bishop cattle, the strange, noisome wreck of the farmhouse, and the bruised, matted vegetation of the fields and roadsides. Whatever had burst loose upon the world had assuredly gone down into the great sinister ravine, for all the trees on the banks were bent and broken, and a great avenue had been gouged in the precipice-hanging underbrush. It was as though a house, launched by an avalanche, had slid down through the tangled growths of the almost vertical slope. From below no sound came, but only a distant, undefinable fetor, and it is not to be wondered at that the men preferred to stay on the edge and argue, rather than descend and beard the unknown Cyclopean horror in its lair. Three dogs that were with the party had barked furiously at first, but seemed cowed and reluctant when near the glen. Someone telephoned the news to the Aylesbury transcript, but the editor, accustomed to wild tales from Dunwich, did no more than concoct a humorous paragraph about it, an item soon afterward reproduced by the Associated Press. That night everyone went home, and every house and barn was barricaded as stoutly as possible. Needless to say, no cattle were allowed to remain in open pasturage, 
About two in the morning, a frightful stench and the savage barking of the dogs awakened the household at Elmer Fry's on the eastern edge of Cold Spring Glen, and all agreed that they could hear a sort of muffled swishing or lapping sound from somewhere outside. Mrs. Fry proposed telephoning the neighbors, and Elmer was about to agree when the noise of splintering wood burst in upon their deliberations. It came, apparently, from the barn and was quickly followed by a hideous screaming and stamping amongst the cattle. The dogs slavered and crouched close to the feet of the fear-numbed family. Fry lit a lantern through force of habit, but knew it would be death to go out into that black farmyard. The children and the women folk whimpered, kept from screaming by some obscure, vestigial instinct of defense which told them their lives depended on silence. At last the noise of the cattle subsided to a pitiful moaning, and a great snapping, crashing and crackling ensued. The fries, huddled together in the sitting room, did not dare to move until the last echoes died away far down in Cold Spring Glen. Then, amidst the dismal moans from the stable and the demoniac piping of late whippoorwills in the glen, Selina Fry tottered to the telephone and spread what news she could of the second phase of the horror. The next day, all the countryside was in a panic, and cowed, Uncommunicative groups came and went where the fiendish thing had occurred. Two titan swaths of destruction stretched from the glen to the Fry farmyard. Monstrous prints covered the bare patches of ground, and one side of the old red barn had completely caved in. Of the cattle, only a quarter could be found and identified. Some of these were in curious fragments, and all that survived had to be shot. Earl Sawyer suggested that help be asked from Aylesbury or Arkham, but others maintained it would be of no use. Old Zebulon Waitley, of a branch that hovered about halfway between soundness and decadence, made darkly wild suggestions about rites that ought to be practiced on the hilltops. He came of a line where tradition ran strong, and his memories of chantings in the great stone circles were not altogether connected with Wilbur and his grandfather. Darkness fell upon a stricken countryside, too passive to organize for real defense. In a few cases, closely related families would band together and watch in the gloom under one roof. But in general, there was only a repetition of the barricading of the night before, and a futile, ineffective gesture of loading muskets and setting pitchforks handily about. Nothing, however, occurred except some hill noises, and when the day came, there were many who hoped that the new horror had gone as swiftly as it had come. There were even bold souls who proposed an offensive expedition down in the glen, though they did not venture to set an actual example to the still reluctant majority. When night came again, the barricading was repeated, though there was less huddling together of families. In the morning both the Fry and the Seth Bishop households reported excitement among the dogs and vague sounds and stenches from afar while early explorers noted with horror a fresh set of the monstrous tracks in the road skirting Sentinel Hill. As before, the sides of the road showed a bruising indicative of the blasphemously stupendous bulk of the horror. Whilst the confirmation of the tracks seemed to argue a passage in two directions, as if the moving mountain had come from Cold Spring Glen and returned to it along the same path. At the base of the hill, a thirty-foot swath of crushed shrubbery saplings led steeply upward, and the seekers gasped when they saw that even the most perpendicular places did not deflect the inexorable trail. Whatever the horror was, it could scale a sheer stony cliff of almost complete verticality. And as the investigators climbed around to the hill's summit by safer routes, they saw that the trail ended, or rather reversed there. It was here that the Waitleys used to build their hellish fires and chant their hellish rituals by the table-like stone on May Eve and Hallowmas. Now that very stone formed the center of a vast space thrashed around by the mountainous horror, whilst upon its slightly concave surface was a thick and fetid deposit of the same tarry stickiness observed on the floor of the ruined Waitley farmhouse when the horror escaped. Men looked at one another and muttered. Then they looked down the hill. Apparently the horror had descended by a route much the same as that of its ascent. To speculate was futile. Reason, logic, and normal ideas of motivation stood confounded. Only old Zebulon, who was not with the group, 
could have done justice to the situation or suggested a plausible explanation. Thursday night began much like the others, but it ended less happily. The whippoorwills in the glen had screamed with such unusual persistence that many could not sleep, and about 3 a.m. all the party telephones rang tremulously. Those who took down their receivers heard a fright-mad voice shriek out, Help! Oh my God! And some thought a crashing sound followed the breaking off of the exclamation. There was nothing more. No one dared do anything, and no one knew till morning whence the call came. Then those who had heard it called everyone on the line and found that only the fries did not reply. The truth appeared an hour later when a hastily assembled group of armed men trudged out to the fry place at the head of the glen. It was horrible, yet hardly a surprise. There were more swathes and monstrous prints, but there was no longer any house. It had caved in like an eggshell, and amongst the ruins, nothing living or dead could be discovered. Only a stench and a tarry stickiness. The Elmer Fries had been erased from Dunwich. Chapter 8 In the meantime, a quieter, yet even more spiritually poignant phase of the horror had been blackly unwinding itself behind the closed door of a shelf-lined room in Arkham. The curious manuscript record or diary of Wilbur Waitley, delivered to Miskatonic University for translation, had caused much worry and bafflement among the experts in languages both ancient and modern. Its very alphabet, notwithstanding a general resemblance to the heavily shaded Arabic used in Mesopotamia, being absolutely unknown to any available authority. The final conclusion of the linguists was that the text represented an artificial alphabet, giving the effect of a cipher. Though none of the usual methods of cryptographic solutions seemed to furnish any clue, even when applied on the basis of every tongue the writer might conceivably have used. The ancient books taken from Waitley's quarters, while absorbingly interesting and in several cases promising to open up new and terrible lines of research among philosophers and men of science, were of no assistance whatever in this matter. One of them, a heavy tome with an iron clasp, was in another unknown alphabet, this one of a very different caste and resembling Sanskrit more than anything else. The old ledger was at length given wholly into the charge of Dr. Armitage, both because of his peculiar interest in the Waitley matter and because of his wide linguistic learning and skill in the mystical formulae of antiquity and the Middle Ages. Armitage had an idea that the alphabet might be something esoterically used by certain forbidden cults which have come down from old times and which have inherited many forms and traditions from the wizards of the Saracenic world. That question, however, he did not deem vital, since it would be unnecessary to know the origin of the symbols if, as he suspected, they were used as a cipher in a modern language. It was his belief that, Considering the great amount of text involved, the writer would scarcely have wished the trouble of using another speech than his own, save perhaps in certain special formulae and incantations. Accordingly, he attacked the manuscript with the preliminary assumption that the bulk of it was in English. Dr. Armitage knew, from the repeated failures of his colleagues, that the riddle was a deep and complex one, and that no simple mode of solution could merit even a trial. All through late August, he fortified himself with the massed lore of cryptography, drawing upon the fullest resources of his own library, and wading night after night amidst the arcana of Trithemius's polygraphia, Giambattista Porta's De Furtivis Literarum Notis, De Visionera's Trait de Chiffre, Falconer's Cryptomenesis Patefacta, Davies's and Thickness's 18th century treatises, and such fairly modern authorities as Blair, von Martin, and Kluber's cryptographic. He interspersed his study of the books with attacks on the manuscript itself, and in time became convinced that he had to deal with one of those subtlest and most ingenious of cryptograms, in which many separate lists of corresponding letters are arranged like the multiplication table and the message built up with arbitrary keywords known only to the initiated. The older authorities seemed rather more helpful than the newer ones, and Armitage concluded that the code of the manuscript was one of great antiquity, no doubt handed down through a long line of mystical experimenters. Several times he seemed near daylight, 
only to be set back by some unforeseen obstacle. Then, as September approached, the clouds began to clear. Certain letters, as used in certain parts of the manuscript, emerged definitely and unmistakably, and it became obvious that the text was indeed in English. On the evening of September 2nd, the last major barrier gave way, and Dr. Armitage read for the first time a continuous passage of Wilbur Waitley's Annals. It was in truth a diary, as all had thought, and it was couched in a style clearly showing the mixed occult erudition and general illiteracy of the strange being who wrote it. Almost the first long passage that Armitage deciphered, an entry dated November 26, 1916, proved highly startling and disquieting. It was written, he remembered, by a child of three and a half who looked like a lad of twelve or thirteen. Today, learned the aclo for the Sabbath, it ran, which did not like, it being answerable from the hill and not from the air. That upstairs more ahead of me than I had thought it would be, and is not like to have much earth brain. Shot Elam Hutchins collie Jack when he went to bite me, and Elam says he would kill me if he dast. I guess he won't. Grandfather kept me saying the dough formula last night, and I think I saw the inner city at the two magnetic poles. I shall go to those poles when the earth is cleared off, if I can't break through with the dough Hana formula when I commit it. They from the air told me at Sabbat that it will be years before I can clear off the earth, and I guess Grandfather will be dead then, so I shall have to learn all the angles of the planes and all the formulas between the year and the Nunga. They from outside will help, but they cannot take body without human blood. That upstairs looks it will have the right cast. I can see it a little when I make the Vorish sign or blow the powder of Ibn Ghazi at it, and it is near like them at Mayeve on the hill. The other face may wear off some. I wonder how I shall look when the earth is cleared and there are no earth beings on it. He that came with the Aklo Sabayoth said, I may be transfigured, there being much of outside to work on. Morning found Dr. Armitage in a cold sweat of terror and a frenzy of wakeful concentration. He had not left the manuscript all night, but sat at his table under the electric light turning page after page with shaking hands as fast as he could decipher the cryptic text. He had nervously telephoned his wife he would not be home, and when she brought him a breakfast from the house, he could scarcely dispose of a mouthful. All that day, he read on, now and then halted maddeningly, as a reapplication of the complex key became necessary. Lunch and dinner were brought him, but he ate only the smallest fraction of either. Toward the middle of the next night, he drowsed off in his chair, but soon woke out of a tangle of nightmares almost as hideous as the truths and menaces to man's existence that he had uncovered. On the morning of September 4th, Professor Rice and Dr. Morgan insisted on seeing him for a while, and departed trembling and ashen grey. That evening he went to bed, but slept only fitfully. Wednesday, the next day, he was back at the manuscript, and began to take copious notes both from the current sections and from those he had already deciphered. In the small hours of that night, he slept a little in an easy chair in his office, but was at the manuscript again before dawn. Sometime before noon, his physician, Dr. Hartwell, called to see him and insisted that he cease work. He refused, intimating that it was of the most vital importance for him to complete the reading of the diary and promising an explanation in due course of time. That evening, just as twilight fell, he finished his terrible perusal and sank back, exhausted. His wife, bringing his dinner, found him in a half-comatose state, but he was conscious enough to warn her off with a sharp cry when he saw her eyes wander toward the notes he had taken. Weakly rising, he gathered up the scribbled papers and sealed them all in a great envelope, which he immediately placed in his inside coat pocket. He had sufficient strength to get home, but was so clearly in need of medical aid that Dr. Hartwell was summoned at once. As the doctor put him to bed, he could only mutter over and over again, But what in God's name can we do? Dr. Armitage slept, but was partly delirious the next day. He made no explanations to Hartwell, but in his calmer moments spoke of the imperative need of a long conference with Rice and Morgan. His wilder wanderings were very startling indeed, including frantic appeals that something in a boarded-up farmhouse be destroyed, 
and fantastic references to some plan for the extirpation of the entire human race and all animal and vegetable life from the earth by some terrible elder race of beings from another dimension. He would shout that the world was in danger, since the elder things wished to strip it and drag it away from the solar system and cosmos of matter into some other plane or phase of entity from which it had once fallen, vigintillions of eons ago. At other times, he would call for the dreaded Necronomicon and the Demonolatria of Remigius, in which he seemed hopeful of finding some formula to check the peril he conjured up. Stop them, stop them, he would shout. Those Waitleys meant to let them in, and the worst of all is left. Tell Rice and Morgan we must do something. It's a blind business, but I know how to make the powder. It hasn't been fed since the 2nd of August, when Wilbur came here to his death, and at that rate... But Armitage had a sound physique despite his 73 years, and slept off his disorder that night without developing any real fever. He woke late Friday, clear of head, though sober with a gnawing fear and tremendous sense of responsibility. Saturday afternoon, he felt able to go over to the library and summon Rice and Morgan for a conference, and the rest of that day and evening, the three men tortured their brains in the wildest speculation and the most desperate debate. Strange and terrible books were drawn voluminously from the stack shelves and from secure places of storage, and diagrams and formulae were copied with feverish haste and in bewildering abundance. Of skepticism, there was none. All three had seen the body of Wilbur Waitley as it lay on the floor in a room of that very building, and after that, not one of them could feel even slightly inclined to treat the diary as a madman's raving. Opinions were divided as to notifying the Massachusetts State Police, and the negative finally won. There were things involved which simply could not be believed by those who had not seen a sample, as indeed was made clear during certain subsequent investigations. Late at night the conference disbanded without having developed a definite plan, but all day Sunday Armitage was busy comparing formulae and mixing chemicals obtained from the college laboratory. The more he reflected on the hellish diary, the more he was inclined to doubt the efficacy of any material agent in stamping out the entity which Wilbur Waitley had left behind him, the earth-threatening entity which, unknown to him, was to burst forth in a few hours and become the memorable Dunwich Horror. Monday was a repetition of Sunday with Dr. Armitage, for the task in hand required an infinity of research and experiment. Further consultations of the monstrous diary brought about various changes of plan, and he knew that even in the end, a large amount of uncertainty must remain. By Tuesday, he had a definite line of action mapped out and believed he would try a trip to Dunwich within a week. Then, on Wednesday, the great shock came. Tucked obscurely away in a corner of the Arkham Advertiser was a facetious little item from the Associated Press, telling what a record-breaking monster the bootleg whiskey of Dunwich had raised up. Armitage, half-stunned, could only telephone for Rice and Morgan. Far into the night they discussed, and the next day was a whirlwind of preparation on the part of them all. Armitage knew he would be meddling with terrible powers, yet saw that there was no other way to annul the deeper and more malign meddling which others had done before him. Chapter 9 Friday morning Armitage, Rice and Morgan set out by motor for Dunwich, arriving at the village about one in the afternoon. The day was pleasant but even in the brightest sunlight a kind of quiet dread and portent seemed to hover about the strangely domed hills and the deep shadowy ravines of the stricken region. Now and then on some mountain top, a gaunt circle of stones could be glimpsed against the sky. From the air of hushed fright at Osborne's store, they knew something hideous had happened and soon learned of the annihilation of the Elmer Fry house and family. Throughout that afternoon, they rode around Dunwich, questioning the natives concerning all that had occurred and seeing for themselves with rising pangs of horror the drear fry ruins with their lingering traces of the tarry stickiness, the blasphemous tracks in the fry yard, the wounded Seth Bishop cattle, and the enormous swaths of disturbed vegetation in various places. The trail up and down Sentinel Hill seemed to Armitage of almost cataclysmic significance, and he looked long at the sinister altar-like stone on the summit. At length, the visitors, 
apprised of a party of state police, which had come from Aylesbury that morning, in response to the first telephone reports of the Fry tragedy, decided to seek out the officers and compare notes as far as practicable. This, however, they found more easily planned than performed, since no sign of the party could be found in any direction. There had been five of them in a car, but now the car stood empty near the ruins in the Fry Yard. The natives, all of whom had talked with the policemen, seemed at first as perplexed as Armitage and his companions. Then, old Sam Hutchins thought of something and turned pale, nudging Fred Farr and pointing to the dank, deep hollow that yawned close by. God, he gasped. I'd tell them not to go down into the glen, and I never thought nobody'd do it with them tracks and that smell and the whip or wheels a-screeching down there in the dark a noonday. A cold shudder ran through natives and visitors alike, and every ear seemed strained in a kind of instinctive, unconscious listening. Armitage, now that he had actually come upon the horror and its monstrous work, trembled with the responsibility he felt to be his. Night would soon fall, and it was then that the mountainous blasphemy lumbered upon its eldritch course. Negotium perambulans in tenebris. The old librarian rehearsed the formulae he had memorized, and clutched the paper containing the alternative one he had not memorized. He saw that his electric flashlight was in working order. Rice, beside him, took from a valise a metal sprayer of the sort used in combating insects, whilst Morgan uncased the big-game rifle on which he relied, despite his colleagues' warnings that no material weapon would be of help. Armitage, having read the hideous diary, knew painfully well what kind of a manifestation to expect. But he did not add to the fright of the Dunwich people by giving any hints or clues. He hoped that it might be conquered without any revelation to the world of the monstrous thing it had escaped. As the shadows gathered, the natives commenced to disperse homeward, anxious to bar themselves indoors, despite the present evidence that all human locks and bolts were useless before a force that could bend trees and crush houses when it chose. They shook their heads at the visitors' plan to stand guard at the Fry ruins near the glen, and as they left, had little expectancy of ever seeing the watchers again. There were rumblings under the hills that night, and the whippoorwills piped threateningly. Once in a while a wind, sweeping up out of Cold Spring Glen, would bring a touch of ineffable fetor to the heavy night air. Such a fetor as all three of the watchers had smelled once before when they stood above a dying thing that had passed for fifteen years and a half as a human being. But the looked-for terror did not appear. Whatever was down there in the glen was biding its time, and Armitage told his colleagues it would be suicidal to try to attack it in the dark. Morning came wanly, and the night sounds ceased. It was a grey, bleak day, with now and then a drizzle of rain, and heavier and heavier clouds, seemed to be piling themselves up beyond the hills to the northwest. The men from Arkham were undecided what to do. Seeking shelter from the increasing rainfall beneath one of the few undestroyed Fry outbuildings, they debated the wisdom of waiting, or of taking the aggressive and going down into the glen in quest of their nameless monstrous quarry. The downpour waxed in heaviness, and distant peals of thunder sounded from far horizons. Sheet lightning shimmered and then a forky bolt flashed near at hand, as if descending into the accursed glen itself. The sky grew very dark, and the watchers hoped that the storm would prove a short, sharp one, followed by clear weather. It was still gruesomely dark, when, not much over an hour later, a confused babble of voices sounded down the road. Another moment brought to view a frightened group of more than a dozen men, running, shouting, and even whimpering hysterically. Someone in the lead began sobbing out words, and the Arkham men started violently when those words developed a coherent form. Oh my god, my god, the voice choked out. It's a-goin' again, and this time by day. It's out. It's out and a-moving this very minute, and only the Lord knows when it'll be on us all. The speaker panted into silence, but another took up his message. Nigh on a hour ago, Zeb Waitley here heard the phone a-ringin', and it was Miss Corey, George's wife that lives down by the junction. She says the hired boy Luther was out driving in the cows from the storm after the big bolt, when he see all the trees a-bending at the mouth of the glen, 
opposite side to this and smelt the same awful smell like he smelt when he found the big tracks last Monday morning. And she says he says they was a swishing lapping sound, more nor what the bend in trees and bushes could make. And all on a sudden the trees along the rud begun to get pushed one side and they was a awful stomping and splashing in the mud. But mind ye, Luther, he didn't see nothing at all, only just the bending trees and underbrush. Then fur ahead where Bishop's Brook goes under the rud, he heard awful creaking and straining on the bridge, and says he could tell the sound of wood a starting to crack and split. And all the whiles he never see a thing, only them trees and bushes a bending. And when the swishing sound got very fur off, on the rod towards Wizard Waitley's and Sentinel Hill, Luther, he had the guts to step up where he'd heard it first and look at the ground. It was all mud and water, and the sky was dark, and the rain was wiping out all tracks about as fast as could be. But beginning at the glen mouth, where the trees had moved, there were still some of them awful prints, big as barrels like he seen Monday. At this point, the first excited speaker interrupted. But that ain't the trouble now, that was only the start. Zeb here was calling folks up and everybody was a listening in when a call from Seth Bishops cut in. His housekeeper Sally was carrying on fit to kill. She just seed the trees a-bending beside the rud and says they was a kind of mushy sound, like an elephant puffing and treading a headin' for the house. Then she up and spoke sudden of a fearful smell and says her boy Chancy was a-screamin' as how it was, just like what he smelt up to the Waitley ruins Monday morning, and the dogs was all barkin' and whinin' awful. And then she let out a terrible yell, and says the shed down the rut had just caved in like the storm he'd blowed it over, only the wind wasn't strong enough to do that. Everybody was a-listenin', and we could hear lots of folks on the wire a-gaspin'. All to once Sally she yelled again, and says the front yard picket fence he'd just crumbled up, though they won't no sign of what done it. Then everybody on the line could hear Chancy and old Seth Bishop a yelling too, and Sally was shrieking out that Southern Heavy had struck the house, not lightning nor nothing, but Southern Heavy again the front, that kept a launching itself again and again, though you couldn't see nothing out the front windows. And then, and then, lines of fright deepened on every face, and Armitage, shaken as he was, had barely poise enough to prompt the speaker. And then, Sally, she yelled out, Oh, help, the house is a-caving in. And on the wire we could hear a terrible crashing, and a hull flock a-screaming, just like when Elmer Fry's place was took, only wuss. The man paused, and another of the crowd spoke. That's all. Not a sound or squeak over the phone art or that, just still like. We that heard it got out Fords and wagons and rounded up as many able-bodied men folks as we could get at Corey's place, and come up here to see what you thought best to do. Not but what I think it's the Lord's judgment for our iniquities that no mortal kin ever set aside. Armitage saw that the time for positive action had come, and spoke decisively to the faltering group of frightened rustics. We must follow it, boys. He made his voice as reassuring as possible. I believe there's a chance of putting it out of business. You men know that those Waitleys were wizards. Well. This thing is a thing of wizardry, and must be put down by the same means. I've seen Wilbur Waitley's diary, and read some of the strange old books he used to read, and I think I know the right kind of spell to recite to make the thing fade away. Of course one can't be sure, but we can always take a chance. It's invisible, I knew it would be, but there's a powder in this long-distance sprayer that might make it shoo up for a second. Later on we'll try it. It's a frightful thing to have alive, but it isn't as bad as what Wilbur would have let in if he'd lived longer. You'll never know what the world has escaped. Now we've only this one thing to fight, and it can't multiply. It can, though, do a lot of harm, so we mustn't hesitate to rid the community of it. We must follow it. And the way to begin is to go to the place that has just been wrecked. Let somebody lead the way. I don't know your roads very well, but I've an idea there might be a shorter cut across lots. How about it? The men shuffled about a moment, and then Earl Sawyer spoke softly, pointing with a grimy finger through the steadily lessening rain. I guess you can get to Seth Bishop's quickest by cutting across the lower meadow here, wading the brook at the low place and climbing through Carrier's mowing and the timber lot beyond. 
That comes out on the upper rud mighty nice Seths, a little t'other side. Armitage, with Rice and Morgan, started to walk in the direction indicated, and most of the natives followed slowly. The sky was growing lighter, and there were signs that the storm had worn itself away. When Armitage inadvertently took a wrong direction, Joe Osborne warned him and walked ahead to show the right one. Courage and confidence were mounting, though the twilight of the almost perpendicular wooded hill which lay toward the end of their shortcut, and among whose fantastic ancient trees they had to scramble as if up a ladder, put these qualities to a severe test. At length they emerged on a muddy road to find the sun coming out. They were a little beyond the Seth Bishop place, but bent trees and hideously unmistakable tracks showed what had passed by. Only a few moments were consumed in surveying the ruins just around the bend. It was the Fry incident all over again, and nothing dead or living was found in either of the collapsed shells which had been the Bishop House and Barn. No one cared to remain there amidst the stench and tarry stickiness, but all turned instinctively to the line of horrible prints leading on toward the wrecked Wotley farmhouse and the altar-crowned slopes of Sentinel Hill. As the men passed the site of Wilbur Waitley's abode, they shuddered visibly, and seemed again to mix hesitancy with their zeal. It was no joke tracking down something as big as a house that one could not see, but that had all the vicious malevolence of a demon. Opposite the base of Sentinel Hill, the tracks left the road, and there was a fresh bending and matting visible along the broad swath, marking the monster's former route to and from the summit. Armitage produced a pocket telescope of considerable power and scanned the steep green side of the hill. Then he handed the instrument to Morgan, whose sight was keener. After a moment of gazing, Morgan cried out sharply, passing the glass to Earl Sawyer and indicating a certain spot on the slope with his finger. Sawyer, as clumsy as most non-users of optical devices are, fumbled a while, but eventually focused the lenses with Armitage's aid. When he did so, his cry was less restrained than Morgan's had been. God Almighty, the grass and bushes is a-moving. It's a-going up slow-like, creeping up to the top this minute. Heaven only knows what fur. Then the germ of panic seemed to spread among the seekers. It was one thing to chase the nameless entity, but quite another to find it. Spells might be all right, but suppose they weren't. Voices began questioning Armitage about what he knew of the thing and no reply seemed quite to satisfy. Everyone seemed to feel himself in close proximity to phases of nature and of being utterly forbidden and wholly outside the sane experience of mankind. Chapter 10 In the end, the three men from Arkham, old, white-bearded Dr. Armitage, stocky, iron-gray Professor Rice, and lean, youngish Dr. Morgan, ascended the mountain alone. After much patient instruction regarding its focusing and use, they left the telescope with the frightened group that remained in the road, and as they climbed, they were watched closely by those among whom the glass was passed around. It was hard going, and Armitage had to be helped more than once. High above the toiling group, the great swath trembled as its hellish maker repassed with snail-like deliberateness. Then it was obvious that the pursuers were gaining. Curtis Waitley, of the undecayed branch, was holding the telescope when the Arkham party detoured radically from the swath. He told the crowd that the men were evidently trying to get to a subordinate peak which overlooked the swath at a point considerably ahead of where the shrubbery was now bending. This indeed proved to be true, and the party was seen to gain the minor elevation only a short time after the invisible blasphemy had passed it. Then, Wesley Corey, who had taken the glass, cried out that Armitage was adjusting the sprayer which Rice held, and that something must be about to happen. The crowd stirred uneasily, recalling that this sprayer was expected to give the unseen horror a moment of visibility. Two or three men shut their eyes, but Curtis Waitley snatched back the telescope and strained his vision to the utmost. He saw that Rice, from the party's point of vantage above and behind the entity, had an excellent chance of spreading the potent powder with marvelous effect. Those without the telescope saw only an instant's flash of grey cloud, a cloud about the size of a moderately large building near the top of the mountain. Curtis, who had held the instrument, 
dropped it with a piercing shriek into the ankle-deep mud of the road. He reeled and would have crumpled to the ground had not two or three others seized and steadied him. All he could do was moan half inaudibly. Oh, oh, great God, that, that, there was a pandemonium of questioning, and only Henry Wheeler thought to rescue the fallen telescope and wipe it clean of mud. Curtis was past all coherence, and even isolated replies were almost too much for him. Bigger in a barn, all made a squirm in ropes. Whole thing sort of shaped like a hen's egg bigger in anything, with dozens of legs like hogsheads that half shut up when they step. Nothing solid about it, all like jelly and made a separate wriggling ropes push close together, great bulging eyes all over it, ten or twenty mouths or trunks are sticking out all along the sides, big as stovepipes, and all are tossing and opening and shutting, all grey, with kind of blue or purple rings, and gored in heaven that half face on top. This final memory, whatever it was, proved too much for poor Curtis, and he collapsed completely before he could say more. Fred Farr and Will Hutchins carried him to the roadside and laid him on the damp grass. Henry Wheeler, trembling, turned the rescued telescope on the mountain to see what he might. Through the lenses were discernible three tiny figures, apparently running toward the summit as fast as the steep incline allowed. Only these, nothing more. Then, everyone noticed a strangely unseasonable noise in the deep valley behind and even in the underbrush of Sentinel Hill itself. It was the piping of unnumbered whippoorwills, and in their shrill chorus there seemed to lurk a note of tense and evil expectancy. Earl Sawyer now took the telescope and reported the three figures as standing on the topmost ridge, virtually level with the altar stone, but at a considerable distance from it. One figure, he said, seemed to be raising its hands above its head at rhythmic intervals, and as Sawyer mentioned the circumstance, the crowd seemed to hear a faint, half-musical sound from the distance, as if a loud chant were accompanying the gestures. The weird silhouette on that remote peak must have been a spectacle of infinite grotesqueness and impressiveness, but no observer was in a mood for aesthetic appreciation. I guess he's saying the spell, whispered Wheeler as he snatched back the telescope. The whippoorwills were piping wildly and in a singularly curious irregular rhythm, quite unlike that of the visible ritual. Suddenly, the sunshine seemed to lessen without the intervention of any discernible cloud. It was a very peculiar phenomenon, and was plainly marked by all. A rumbling sound seemed brewing beneath the hills, mixed strangely with a concordant rumbling which clearly came from the sky. Lightning flashed aloft, and the wandering crowd looked in vain for the portents of storm. The chanting of the men from Arkham now became unmistakable, and Wheeler saw through the glass that they were all raising their arms in the rhythmic incantation. From some farmhouse far away came the frantic barking of dogs. The change in the quality of the daylight increased, and the crowd gazed about the horizon in wonder. A purplish darkness, born of nothing more than a spectral deepening of the sky's blue, pressed down upon the rumbling hills. Then the lightning flashed again, somewhat brighter than before, and the crowd fancied that it had showed a certain mistiness around the altar stone on the distant height. No one, however, had been using the telescope at that instant. The whippoorwills continued their irregular pulsation, and the men of Dunwich braced themselves tensely against some imponderable menace with which the atmosphere seemed surcharged. Without warning came those deep, cracked, raucous vocal sounds which will never leave the memory of the stricken group who heard them. Not from any human throat were they born, for the organs of man can yield no such acoustic perversions. Rather, would one have said they came from the pit itself, had not their source been so unmistakably the altar stone on the peak. It is almost erroneous to call them sounds at all, since so much of their ghastly, infra-bass timbre spoke to dim seats of consciousness and terror far subtler than the ear, yet one must do so, since their form was indisputably though vaguely that of half-articulate words. They were loud, loud as the rumblings and the thunder above which they echoed. Yet did they come from no visible being, and because imagination might suggest a conjectural source in the world of non-visible beings, the huddled crowd at the mountain's base huddled still closer and winced 
as if in expectation of a blow. Ignai, Ignai, Thuthkanga, Yogsothoth, rang the hideous croaking out of space. The speaking impulse seemed to falter here, as if some frightful psychic struggle were going on. Henry Wheeler strained his eye at the telescope, but saw only the three grotesquely silhouetted human figures on the peak, all moving their arms furiously in strange gestures as their incantation drew near its culmination. From what black wells of acherontic fear or feeling, from what unplumbed gulfs of extracosmic consciousness or obscure, long-latent heredity, were those half-articulate thunder croakings drawn? Presently, they began to gather renewed force and coherence as they grew in stark, utter, ultimate frenzy. Yeah, help, help, f -f -f father, father, Yog Sothoth. But that was all. The pallid group in the road, still reeling at the indisputably English syllables that had poured thickly and thunderously down from the frantic vacancy beside that shocking altar stone, were never to hear such syllables again. Instead, they jumped violently at the terrific report which seemed to rend the hills the deafening, cataclysmic peal whose source, be it inner earth or sky, no hero was ever able to place. A single lightning bolt shot from the purple zenith to the altar stone, and a great tidal wave of viewless force and indescribable stench swept down from the hill to all the countryside. Trees, grass and underbrush were whipped into a fury, and the frightened crowd at the mountain's base, weakened by the lethal fetor that seemed about to asphyxiate them, were almost hurled off their feet. Dogs howled from the distance, green grass and foliage wilted to a curious sickly yellow-gray, and over field and forest were scattered the bodies of dead whippoorwills. The stench left quickly, but the vegetation never came right again. To this day, there is something queer and unholy about the growths on and around that fearsome hill. Curtis Waitley was only just regaining consciousness when the Arkham men came slowly down the mountain in the beams of a sunlight once more brilliant and untainted. They were grave and quiet, and seemed shaken by memories and reflections even more terrible than those which had reduced the group of natives to a state of cowed quivering. In reply to a jumble of questions, they only shook their heads and reaffirmed one vital fact. The thing has gone forever, Armitage said. It has been split up into what it was originally made of and can never exist again. It was an impossibility in a normal world. Only the least fraction was really matter in any sense we know. It was like its father, and most of it has gone back to him in some vague realm or dimension outside our material universe. Some vague abyss out of which only the most accursed rites of human blasphemy could ever have called him for a moment on the hills. There was a brief silence, and in that pause, the scattered senses of poor Curtis Waitley began to knit back into a sort of continuity so that he put his hands to his head with a moan. Memory seemed to pick itself up where it had left off, and the horror of the sight that had prostrated him burst in upon him again. Oh, oh my God, that half-face, that half-face on top of it, that face with the red eyes and albino hair, and no chin, like the Waitleys. It was an octopus, centipede, spider kind of thing, but there was a half-shaped man's face on top of it, and it looked like Wizard Waltley's. Only it was yards and yards across. He paused exhausted, as the whole group of natives stared in a bewilderment not quite crystallized into fresh terror. Only old Zebulon Waitley, who wanderingly remembered ancient things, but who had been silent heretofore, spoke aloud. Fifteen year gone, he rambled. I heard old Waitley say as how someday we'd hear a child of Lavanese a-callin' its father's name on the top of Sentinel Hill. But Joe Osborne interrupted him to question the Arkham men anew. What was it anyhow, and however did young wizard Waitley call it out of the air it come from? Armitage chose his words very carefully. It was, well, it was mostly a kind of force that doesn't belong in our part of space. A kind of force that acts and grows and shapes itself by other laws than those of our sort of nature. We have no business calling in such things from outside and only very wicked people and very wicked cults ever try to. There was some of it in Wilbur Waitley himself, enough to make a devil and a precocious monster of him, and to make his passing out a pretty terrible sight. 
I'm going to burn his accursed diary, and if you men are wise, you'll dynamite that altar stone up there and pull down all the rings of standing stones on the other hills. Things like that brought down the beings those Woatleys were so fond of, the beings they were going to let in tangibly to wipe out the human race and drag the earth off to some nameless place for some nameless purpose. But as to this thing we've just sent back, the Waitleys raised it for a terrible part in the doings that were to come. It grew fast and big from the same reason that Wilbur grew fast and big. But it beat him because it had a greater share of the outsideness in it. You needn't ask how Wilbur called it out of the air. He didn't call it out. It was his twin brother, but it looked more like the father than he did.